We're back. Take two for today. Take two. <laughs> take two. We had some audio problems, but we fixed them. So here we are, nice and clear and crisp. <laughs> yes, take two. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for coming back, guys. Um, joined, as always, by my friend Lauren Rosen. I did it wrong. You did it wrong. We practiced. Did it wrong. We practiced, and I got it wrong anyway. Uh, <laughs> L- Lauren is a licensed marriage and family therapist practicing in Southern California and specializing in anxiety and anxiety disorders. She's the obsessive mind on Instagram. You should check her out. Um, and uh, if you're coming from my side, this is the, the one and only Drew Linsalata, <laughs> uh, the dot anxious dot truth on Instagram, the anxious truth. He writes, he's in grad school and he's going to be a therapist in the mm. great state of New York. So check him out if you haven't already. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we get together once a month and we do these little chats always related to anxiety, anxiety recovery and that sort of stuff. And today we're going to talk about the RP and ERP and why it is literally the most important part, even though if you're watching right now, you might not know that. Yeah. Most people are so focused on the exposure part. And I think, I wonder, I'm obviously so curious as to your thoughts on this. One of Mm -hmm. the things that strikes me is that it often, when we're talking about exposure and response prevention, Mm -hmm. we often shorten it to exposure. And I think that that leads to a lot of misconceptions about the process. Don't you? I think so. Because a lot of people hear the word exposure therapy. It's exposure therapy. And we, we leave out the other part. And it was interesting because when I was actually writing The Anxious Truth, it dawned on me like, oh, wait a minute. I have to write about the RP part. Like everything is ERP. It's not just ERP. It's not just for OCD anymore. Um, All exposure is ERP. Yes. In the end. Yeah. Yes. Including if we look at things like PTSD and and, and trauma treatment, if we're doing prolonged exposure, Mm -hmm. what's implicit in the discussion are the safety behaviors that people are doing secondary to the sometimes when they are facing triggers yeah coming into treatment so i think uh, like kind of the overarching statement or to get us kicked off is a lot of people know about exposure so in my community for sure and i get every day like i don't know how i'm doing all the things i'm doing all the things and nothing is changing and i think the first misconception is no, I'm doing all the things, but I still feel afraid or I still feel discomfort. It's not working. So the first misconception about ERP or exposure and response prevention is that you have to find a way to do the exposure without being uncomfortable. That's what a successful exposure is. That's not what a successful exposure is is at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a happy thing when it happens, I guess. Nobody wants to feel like crap, but that's not the goal. No, in fact, it can't be effective if it's not. And uh, ultimately, if you're not feeling some anxiety or some discomfort when you're either doing uh, planned exposures or sort of rogue, unintentional uh, life, aka life, life. exposure, yeah, yeah exactly. That yeah. at some point, in order to get better at feeling anxious, you have to practice feeling anxious differently. Yeah. So the whole point of the exposure, which is probably, the, I'm glad we're bringing this up first, is to feel uncomfortable. You're yeah. doing it to feel uncomfortable. And I think a lot of people, they get confused and they think, oh, exposure is where I learn to do this thing without being afraid, or I learn to do it without panic, or I learn to do it without feeling the need to engage with my compulsions. But that's that's not how that works at all. No. You're, yeah, you're intentionally trying to come up against yeah. that, right? Yeah, you're, you're trying to confront that in a way. So the RP, what does RP stand for in ERP? Well, it stands for response prevention as well, you know. Um, But I think response, the yeah, and the responses that we're talking about vary in name based on the disorder that you're talking about in Mm -hmm. OCD and BDD. Those are compulsions in generalized anxiety, social anxiety, phobias, agoraphobia panic disorder we call them safety behaviors Mm -hmm. and ultimately they're the same thing so the response when we're talking about response prevention and exposure we're not talking about prevent the response isn't the anxiety we're not trying to prevent the anxiety or the fear or the discomfort we're trying to prevent the things you do to minimize that yep Yep, yeah exactly so do you think it'd be helpful for people if we talked about what that can look like depending on the disorder, maybe some examples. Yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. 
So one example, health anxiety, we might see people as a, a safety behavior or you know compulsion, depending on the verbiage that you're using, either excessively calling a clinician or looking up things repeatedly on Google or for excessive periods of time about symptoms that they're having. We would consider these to be safety behaviors because they're intended to keep the person safe from whatever perceived danger they might mm -hmm. be uh, believe that they're being exposed to. What's, uh, what's another one? Okay, that's a good one. Uh, so if you are, for instance, if you're dealing with panic disorder and you are going into situations that you think might trigger your panic, the response prevention, the responses that we're trying to prevent you from engaging in would be calling your significant other or your friend to talk you through or snapping a rubber band or sniffing essential oils or having your mints or your cold water or running back home. Probably the biggest response that we're trying to inhibit is don't run back home and escape the exposure because you feel anxious. So the response isn't the anxiety. We want that response. We just don't want you to respond to it. Yes. The response yeah. that we're looking to prevent is the response to the anxiety, not the anxiety itself, like you said, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what about an OCD? Clearly ERP coming out of the OCD community. It's not just for OCD. I'm not kidding. That's not real. That's everything is ERP. Agreed. So yeah. in OCD, let's take, for instance, harm OCD, somebody uh, who, uh, let's take specifically hit and run. So if you are, you are driving and you feel a bump in the road, oh my gosh, does that mean that I hit somebody? A compulsion or the response that we're trying to prevent would involve going back driving back to check and see if you actually, if there are police or if there's somebody lying in the middle of the road, you might also uh, check the news when you get home or check your car to see if there are dents in it, or you might even just ruminate a whole lot about it like go over and over the memory in your mind to try to make sure that you didn't actually hit somebody. Mm. And we, we don't want to do that. So response we prevention don't. is don't do that. Right. I know you want to do all those things. Don't do those things. That's the prevention of the response. Yes. Because, yeah. and I, I think, well, we can go back, we can get to this later, but because of the fact that those are the things that are impairing your life, not the thoughts, not the feelings, it's the behaviors that are causing all the trouble. And those behaviors also increase the anxiety in a, in a sad turn yeah. of events. That's true. I mean, it, they may decrease the anxiety immediately on the short term, but on the long term, it's pouring gas on the fire. Right. And oftentimes, even in the short term, it does feed mm. them, which is kind of cruel. But it's true that it, if you're ruminating about something, for instance, it, the, the likelihood that you're going to come to some conclusion that's going to satisfy right. you and get rid of your anxiety is exceedingly low. Hmm. I bet that's probably true in those instances where the anxiety is based on trying to answer the unanswerable or know the mm -hmm. unknowable. Yeah, like existential trying. OCD or, yeah, yeah. That, that's absolutely true. What about like social anxiety? What's a good safety behavior in social anxiety? I think so, social anxiety is a, is a little bit different sometimes. I, the more I learned about social anxiety as that sort of shame-based disorder, like most people describe social and people way smarter than me have educated me on this i can't take credit for this but um so most people think that social anxiety is the fear of being judged or somehow you know being uh, evaluated and so much of it stems from the fact that it's not don't look at me it's don't see me i don't not don't judge me it's don't see me because i see myself as inherently broken i see my flaws i see myself as unworthy and if you look at me and examine me you will see that too so the way it's, that was the way it's been described to me by quite a few people in the social anxiety community. And that makes a whole lot of sense. So I would think in social anxiety, it is the safety behaviors or the, those responses that we're trying to inhibit would be to try to cover up those perceived flaws. Um, I won't speak because I think that I, I never make sense. I'm not entertaining enough. I'm boring. So I just won't speak. Well, in that situation, you'll have to take the risk that you are going to bore somebody. Yep. So, yeah, it could be really nuanced, but I think that's a good social anxiety. Uh, I won't speak or I won't eat in front of people because then they'll see 
that I, I'm not refined or I'm awkward. And I see myself that way. So I don't want you to see me that way. So I won't eat in social situations. Totally. Or I'll yeah. ask my, my safe person for reassurance about how I acted in that, that situation. And it's such an interesting point that you bring up too about, about shame, because I think in some respects, exposure and response prevention here looks like doing the the talking right that would be the exposure part and then the response prevention prevention rather is not in the aftermath of that that you're not going back and reviewing what the other person's facial expressions were and not uh trying to pick apart what all of it meant um but i i think it, we can also look at vulnerability Mm -hmm. as pra the practice of vulnerability as an exposure ultimately yeah that makes sense. yeah for sure yeah. and i think in a way when you engage in the rp part and you inhibit those responses that are designed to soothe you or find the answer you're you are essentially allowing the worst outcome to be to be true in almost mm -hmm. all cases uh, if i panic and i feel like i'm going to have a psychotic break because my panic is too strong well, if I inhibit my responses, I'm essentially allowing that psychotic break to happen. Or at least allowing for the possibility. Yeah, correct. Correct. And I, I always say that because it, there's, there's brutality when I say that to people. Well, you'll have to allow the heart attack. Oh, well, what do you mean? Yeah, but truly, I know in your mind, you are literally resigning yourself to a heart attack, a psychotic break. Ostrac yeah. being ostracized from your family, you know, whatever the, the fear might be. Uh, totally. So, yeah. So RP is tough because it, it's, it's exactly that you want to try to get safe. And when you engage in response prevention, you are not trying to seek safety in that moment, which is completely counterintuitive for human beings. 100%. Yeah. It's like, let me just, and it's interesting, the idea of exposure, it, it almost, because when I think of like expo not exposing oneself in like a an allude way, but like yeah. expo like uncovering, right? Like opening up to this experience. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's this great sculpture. I don't know if I've ever mentioned it to you. It's one of my favorites. It's by an artist named Paige Bradley, and it's called Expansion. And in it is a woman who has all of these cracks in her. She's naked. She's sitting in the lotus position. She's got all of these cracks and there's a light coming through those cracks from it within her and it kind of reminds me of the japanese art of kintsugi uh, where basically they drop pottery on purpose and then they glue it back together with gold and so it but it's the same idea is that like the beauty comes from the cracks from the opening from from the expansion and I, I do think that there's a lot I, that the reason I love one of the reasons I love that s statue is it really represents what it's like to do exposure and response prevention. It's it's opening and then staying open. Yeah. And we don't want to do that. That's scary. Well, we're trying to prevent the cracks. See, this is why you're my people. <laughs> I, I'm looking at I, I had a Google ad. It. It's yeah. that's great. That's an amazing piece of art. Um, and I love the way you describe it because the exposure, we would, we don't want to do the exposure because we're trying to prevent the cracks, yeah. but really, and this gets a little philosophical here, it's the cracks that make us who we are. The cracks are the experiences that we learn from. I can, I can crack, but it just becomes part of me and part of my experience. And I incorporate it and I learn and I get stronger from the crack. So how do you grow if you don't crack? Correct. You wouldn't learn anything if you just try and always just everything needs to be like this. So that, yeah. that's a tough one. Let this, let's get a little geeky for a second here and talk about the difference between habituation and inhibitory learning, because this is okay. part and part, right? We're going to super geek <laughs> out, but people, people need to hear this because I think most people understand the concept of habituation. And so I get asked all the time. So if I just keep doing this, if I just keep driving on the highway, what, I'll get used to it. Mm. Yeah but not if you drive on the highway loaded up with, you know, Xanax and, and your phone and, and, you know, and a timer to make sure that it's only 60 seconds to the next interchange. So you got to have both of those things. Habituation by itself, which is probably what we were after 25 years ago or 30 years ago. Yeah, it works, but it doesn't appear to be long lasting. Yes. And it doesn't predict long-term recovery. Right. So which makes total sense to me. So just to sort of outline to those who are watching the the main difference, right? Should we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we probably down? should. I think it's, people need to know. Yeah. So 
essentially with habituation, like what, what Drew was talking about is that you go on the freeway over and over again. What they found is that over time you get used to it. And that's what we talk to kids about, right? Like you get used to it. Goody. That's mm-hmm. what we used to, we were taught to, to teach yeah. kids. And it's true that that often will happen. That being said, oftentimes people do the exposure work with the direct intent of trying to make their thoughts and feelings go away. And that can only ever be, in my clinical experience, a side effect. Mm -hmm. Because the second that we start to aim for thoughts and feelings to go away, we are now not actually accepting their presence and developing a different relationship with them that's going to support us in experiencing them and not getting caught up in these behaviors, which again is, a, is more of a predictor of long-term recovery, especially because anxiety disorders, OCD are constantly morphing, constantly shifting. So the next time that you have a trigger that has nothing to do with whatever you're triggered by now, mm-hmm. if if you are tied to this habituation model, now you're stuck. Now it's like, oh no, but I'm anxious again. What, what does this mean? I'm stuck, I'm back versus, oh, of course I'm anxious again. Okay, well, what's it like to feel anxious? Hello, anxiety, good to see you. I've been right. waiting for you uh, to, to show up, right? Like there's a definitely a different MO. Yeah. Yeah. There's truth in that because I think you can't, and to tie it back into the re- response prevention, you can't have response prevention if all you're trying to do is habituate. You will never get used to it if right. you're not willing to fully experience it. So I think that's where people get, get caught up in it. Like, I'm not getting used to it. I've been doing it over and over. Yeah, because you're you're still trying to engineer a specific emotional and internal experience while you're doing this thing. And you can't. You just have to let whatever experience happens happen. Right. Uh, and then I, I love it. Ride the wave. Correct. Learn to ride the wave. Um, so if you are relying only on I will get used to it and I will try to get used to it by making it as comfortable as I can for me with all my safety rituals and devices, mm-hmm. then you might get used to it. But all you do is learn to panic. You learn to go to the supermarket without panicking is what you learn. But what Lauren pointed, I think, is really great. If you rely only on habituation and you engineer habituation, it doesn't become portable across contexts. So people will think, oh, my God, I have to learn how to do everything. I have to learn to go to the supermarket again. I have to learn to drive my kids to school. I have to learn to fly. No, not really. Yeah. That's not the case. Right. But so it's not practical. <laughs> no, that wouldn't be practical. It would take us all forever to recover. That clearly doesn't happen. So why doesn't it happen? So inhibitory learning to, you know, we're getting a little geeky here, but that's the part where you inhibit your response to RP and you learn the lesson, literally inhibitory learning that whether I do these things or not, I wind up okay. Everything yes. works out. Yeah. I can handle this. Yeah. And that I was, I'm actually talking about the, or I was just talking about this with some colleagues for, uh, we're working on a presentation and there's so many cool parts of inhibitory learning. I also want to give a nod toward acceptance and commitment therapy because mm-hmm. I think it, it's sort of habituation from the nerdiness point of view, habituation leads to inhibitory learning, which leads directly into ACT um, in terms of a, an approach to exposure and response prevention. I'll break that down for you guys because I'm not trying to just say yeah, we're getting super geeky, but it's okay. We're just but trying no, to, but, we're just saying words now. <laughs> well, it's just words, words, but no, it is really important because so if we look at an inhibitory learning theory, the, the model changes from how do we get used to this to how do we get better at feeling distress? How do we get better at the skill of the stress tolerance? Yeah. And what happens is that from the habituation standpoint, if we, the idea is that we extinguish a response. So we think Pavlov Mm -hmm. and his dogs, if you ring a bell with the food, right? The dogs Mm -hmm. are going to begin to salivate when you ring the bell. If you stop presenting the food to the dogs with the bell, then over time that connection will loosen and mm-hmm. they will stop salivating, right? So that, that response will stop. From an inhibitory learning perspective, it's not because that, that initial association goes away, right? The, the dog still has this proclivity to experience the bell as indicative of the food. However, another association becomes stronger. 
right? Yeah, that's so important. Right? Yeah. yeah. You learn, you're learning. It's an inhibitory learning theory is really about learning. And you're learning over time that that you can feel anxious and terrified when doing this. You can laugh and also feel anxious. You can um, mm -hmm. not feel anxious. You can, like, there are all of these different experiences that you are capable of having. Now, and there's much more to inhibitory learning theory in terms of unpacking it, but I think that this is where I tend toward the ACT model because ultimately I don't, I think it's less about even learning that things go differently and just being totally and utterly willing to feel all your feelings and have all your thoughts. Yeah, That's so real willing. freedom. Yeah, the willingness. So it's it's so important when you're engaging in exposure and response prevention. I did a podcast episode on this willingness, and that's big in the ACT world, is is such a key component. I have to be willing to have a full set of not just external experiences. I'm on the highway or I'm, I'm repeating my trigger words in the mirror, but a full set of internal experiences. I feel fear. I feel discomfort. I feel uncertainty. You have to be willing to experience all of them, and then you will learn from them. Yes. And then they yeah. cease to bother you. Then they can be there and you can yeah. non-judgmentally witness them instead of wishing them away, which is the whole problem from an act perspective is that we're constantly resisting the presence of yeah. these things that are inevitabilities in life. And it's interesting. I just was, I, I met with somebody yesterday who's at a great a point in their recovery where I can go over the list of exposures that we've worked on and she mm. can say, yeah, so I, I totally feel anxious when that comes up, and but it's okay, and <laughs> so there's it's not that it goes away, it's that all of a sudden it ceases to matter that you're anxious. And that's what leads to the extinguishing or the extinction of the safety behaviors. Now I don't, I don't feel a need to save myself from a panic attack anymore. It's a, right. com a completely different experience for me now than it used to be. Although I think that that's more of what happens with the inhibitory learning side of things, right? Is that, mm -hmm. or with the, with the habituation more than the act because, and, and that's where I, I think sometimes you're still going to feel a strong urge to do the behavior, but that's a, that's oh, a sure. variable thing, right? Like it, it ebbs and flows. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it's not like we ever get rid of that, that. Yeah knee-jerk reaction to maybe do the behavior it's that over time it gets weaker and weaker and we become it's it's a habit basically yeah i i have the ability now to feel that strong urge to do the safety behavior if i weren't to experience panic yes. but but it only lasts for a couple of seconds and i can back away from it and put some space between me and it and then make a different choice that's the difference yep. now Totally. Um, That's it. Yeah. That is exactly and it's the, it. It's the willingness to have that experience fully and the engagement in the RP part. I stopped trying to save myself. That leads you to that. So yes. Yeah. That's, but if you, that's if why you the RP keep, matters. If, if you keep doing it, wasn't it you who was saying about the, the guy in New Jersey who sits on his porch and, uh, and keeps the elephants away with his shotgun? Oh, that wasn't me, but I, now I need to hear about this <laughs> clearly. I was not a real person, but, uh, but it's, it's tantamount to having an anxiety disorder or OCD is tantamount to being, you know, some, some dude out on a lawn in New Jersey being like with a shotgun saying, I'm keeping the elephants away. Somebody might ask like, what elephants? He would say, well, I'm doing exactly. a hell of a good job. Do uh, yeah. Like if I stop <laughs> doing this, the elephants are going to come, which arguably I think that would be way cool because you know elephants in well, Jersey who wouldn't want that? elephants on their front lawn of course but hello that's a great but, that's a great sort of illustration yeah so if we never if we keep doing all of that we keep sitting on the lawn if we keep uh calling our doctors repeatedly or uh avoiding talking to people uh, because of our social anxiety or uh, yeah. what have you then you're never going to learn that that either the bad thing doesn't happen or that you're capable of handling whatever comes up, even if it is not the, the experience that you wanted. Yeah. And I think that that varies. That's on a spectrum. Sometimes we discover like, oh, there were there are no elephants and that's OK. Sometimes you do actually 
reach a state of certainty that's like, oh, that can't happen. That's right. That was just my anxious brain inventing things. Right. I had one woman once who, and I tell the story often, who was afraid that gravity was going to turn off. And I now encountered two people that had that fear. But, you know, in the end, you know, you would reach the conclusion like, oh, that was just really an oversensitized brain making things up. I know that doesn't yeah. really happen. I can be pretty sure that that won't happen. It's um, probably not. Yeah, it's, it's highly yeah, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah. 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 The laws of nature say it's not going to happen. And I can recognize that. But other things like maybe someone will judge me or say something nasty to me or maybe I will panic and, and scream because I panic. And yeah, that could happen, but you'll handle it. Yeah. So, but you don't get yeah. to know that you're going to handle it unless you put yourself handle in those it. circumstances and handle it. Yeah. Yeah. The RP. It's all about the RP. So it's about yeah. refraining from those things that you think are supposed to make an exposure easier, calmer, less anxious. You can yeah. get through it. Um, if you don't, if you continue to engage in those safety responses, then you're just teaching yourself how to do things. Yep. And, and, and well, I made it this time. I made it through because of my cold water and mints, but you're always going to make it through even without. Right. And then the responses actually rob you of recognizing your own capacity and yeah. feeling really empowered, which is interesting, right? Like I, I think that you have to be willing to feel your feelings. And the, the bonus for that is that you end up feeling good, not because you get rid of feelings, but because you end up feeling really proud of yourself for doing a hard thing and feeling empowered and, and probably reflecting back and recognizing your own courage that that's likely to make you feel good too. So yeah, it's, it's not about feeling better, but it is a side effect that often accompanies going headlong into exposure without doing the responses. It's so interesting because it really morphs the same exact experience feeling bad can actually yeah. turn out to feel good. Like it, yeah. it's crazy. It sounds you feel good about feeling bad. Yeah. It's like being sore makes no the sense. Gym. But, right. Yeah, yeah. This, this hurts like hell, but look, I look what I did. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. How ex I mean, as a clinician, I know you can appreciate this. How exciting is it to see somebody make the turn from I made it to I did it? That's like yeah. the best high five moment that there is. Like, yeah, you yeah. did it. And it's so exciting for them. Like, oh my God, I did it. Like, yeah, you yes. did it. As yeah. opposed to I made it. Yeah. It's so. so true. That's such a good distinction of like, <sighs> right. The, the white yeah. knuckles finally release. I made it versus, yeah. you know what? I did that. I showed up. I was a badass bam and that feeling comes from not engaging in the safety behaviors the rp so yeah. we'll wrap it up because we're getting a little close but i know we have to answer this question because anybody watching is going to end. but how but how lauren how do i not call my husband how do i not snap my rubber band how do i not run home that's always the hundred thousand dollar question okay i understand but how how am i supposed to do that well you got another two I, hours i yeah right I, but I'm, I'm, I thought of elephants again. And I, how do you eat an elephant? Yeah. Like one bite at a time. One bite at a time. I, yeah. we were talking about this on one of, one of the episodes that we've done and you were talking about, I think it was last episode, actually taking one step at a time toward doing the exposure of going into work. That's just, yeah. okay. Right. Right now I'm just tying my shoes. Right. That's all I'm doing. I'm tying my shoes. So right, right. now, uh, in, you know, I'm not calling my husband. Instead, I am breathing in and then I'm breathing out. And then I'm noticing that the tree is swaying in the breeze. And I'm, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really great. You, that how do you do it is break it down if you have to. There's no harm in that. Uh, yeah. Because any time that you do even part of that and move toward because people will say like, oh my God, how am I ever going to go back to work and sit for eight hours? That seems impossible. Well, yeah. that's because you're imagining a full eight hour shift, five days a week, full time. Like you went from housebound immediately to back to work. And if you build it back up, yeah. it doesn't matter how small the step is. If you're experiencing fear and discomfort while you take it, you're learning. It's okay. You're making progress. So one little yeah. bit at a time. And you got to be brave. There's no, mm. there's no way around that. There's some courage in this. For sure. Yeah, yeah, the courage to, to feel your feelings and to tolerate the unknown, yeah. which we're doing all, all the time anyway. But this is where, sorry, I know That's I go off on tangents. But no, it's okay. Say it's... The, the courage piece, 
right? Like that's where if we reorient toward be, uh, sh showing up in a courageous way, that also mm -hmm. empowers us instead of like, I want to feel sure. I want to show up in a way that even, even if I don't feel sure, I'm just, I'm still doing that's it right. anyway because I want to live my that's life. Good. Yeah, that's really good. It's really good. That was worth the price of admission right there. That's a whole other conversation. We could probably it do is. an episode on that. Like selective tolerance of uncertainty and unsuredness. Yeah. We're uncertain about 95% of the universe. Most of it, we're like, yeah. oh, we don't even think about that uncertainty, but some gets sticky. We can talk about that yeah. in another one. Why, <laughs> I think that why would be a that? great idea. It'd be good. Why, right. Why do we only tolerate certain unknowables? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I'm wondering too, there might be another with RP and ERP one that where we talk about what the problem is with the responses. Does that yeah, make that's sense? good. What, yeah, why are the responses problematic? What does that? What yes. does it do? Yeah. All right, so that might be the next one. We'll follow up with with why are the RPs? Why are the R's bad? Why do we R with a line through it? Why yeah. do we not want the R's? So <laughs> exactly. All well, right, that'll be our next one. Good. We already have a topic. So now we have two topics to talk about. It's done. good. We're all set. We're good until like August now. Damn. Um, <laughs> anyway, for those of you who yeah hung on hung on through the whole thirty minutes, we appreciate that. Um, hopefully, yeah. it's been helpful. This is always on my YouTube, so. I mean, I, I don't bother posting them on Instagram because Instagram hates 30 minute video. No one's going to watch it. Yeah. So I put them on YouTube. They're always going to be here. You can always come back, ask questions or whatever. If it's a question for Lauren, I'll try to relay it over. Um, and I've been trying know, to post we'll on my best. page too. So on, on YouTube, but so yeah, hopefully, yeah, I'll do that. Oh too. yeah. Put them up. Uh, so One for sure, if you're watching on YouTube, I'll, I'll put a link. You have, you have a YouTube, don't you? Mm -hmm. I do. All right. Yep. So I'll put a link to Lauren's YouTube. You can find them there too. Post them there. You should totally do that. Um, Anyway, if you guys have questions or comments, let us know. And if you're not following Miss Lauren on Instagram, she is at The Obsessive Mind. You should totally do that. Uh, and that's your website, too, theobsessivemind.com, right? It that's is. That, well, yeah. thank you. And, yeah. uh, and Drew's theanxioustruth.com. And you really should follow him on Instagram. He comes up with great content all the time. And uh, the dot anxious dot truth. And here we are. And one day we'll do an episode on, I just remember the first time you were literally sitting in a chair, I think in your office, holding up a whiteboard with a sign on it. That was like, yes, what's on that sign. <laughs> and I, and I, that was like two years ago. And I followed you when we just started communicating back and forth. They're like, she gets it. She gets it. This is a good one. So I'm so happy to be able to do these with you. Um, it's one of the coolest parts of the month. So it's really great. Um, all right, guys. Too. Yeah. Thanks for coming by. We'll see you on the next one later. See you then. Bye.